Good morning, everyone. I will now call to order the second meeting in 2022 of the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. Welcome. I'm Dr. Cynthia Powell, committee chair. We'll begin by taking roll. For committee members, Kyle Brothers. Here. Representing the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Carla Cuthbert. I'm here. Jane DeLuca. Here. Representing the Food and Drug Administration, Kelly Kelm. Representing Health Resources and Services Administration, Michael Warren. Here. Sean McCandless. Present. Jennifer Kwan. Here. Representing the National Institutes of Health, Melissa Parisi. Here. Shanika Panpakun. Here. I'm here, Cynthia Powell and Scott Schoen. Here. Next, our organizational representatives from the American Academy of Family Physicians, Robert Ostrander. I thought I saw him earlier. Maybe we'll double check in a minute. Um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, Deborah Friedenberg. Here. From the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, Maximilian Mjunka. I'm here. From the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Stephen Ralston. From the Association of Women's Health, Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, Katie Sw Swainier. I'm here. From the Child Neurology Society, Margie Ream. I'm here. Department of Defense, Jacob Hogue. I'm here. And today representing Genetic Alliance, Mariana Rhea. I'm here. From the March of Dimes, Siobhan Dolan. Here. From the National Society of Genetic Counselors, Kate Walsh Vockley. I'm here. And from the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, Gerard Berry. Present. Thank you. I'll now turn things over to Su Yun Kim, our acting designated federal official. Thank you, Dr. Powell. I will now go over a few standard reminders for the committee. As a committee, we are advisory to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, not the Congress. For anyone associated with the committee or due to your membership on the committee, if you receive inquiries about the ACHDNC, please let Dr. Powell and I know prior to committing to the interview or presentation. I must also remind committee members that you must recuse yourself from participation in all particular matters likely to affect the financial interests of any organization with which you serve as an officer, director, trustee, or general partner, unless you're also an employee of the organization, or unless you have received a waiver from HH HHS authorizing you to participate. As in the case today, when a vote is scheduled or any activity is proposed and you have a question about a potential conflict of interest, please notify me immediately. Next slide, please. According to FACA, all committee meetings are open to the public. If the public wish to participate in the discussion, the procedures for doing so are published in the Federal Register and or are announced at the opening of a meeting. For this meeting, there is no public chat feature in the Federal Register notice, we said that there would be a public comment period. Only with advance approval of the chair or DFO may public participants question committee members or other presenters. Public participants may submit written statements. Also, public participants should be advised that committee members are given copies of all written statements submitted by the public. As a reminder, it is stated in the FRN, as well as the registration website, that all written public comments are part of the official meeting record and are shared with committee members. 
Any further public participation will be solely at the discretion of the chair and the DFO. If there are no further questions, if there are no questions, I'll turn it back to Dr. Powell. Thank you, Suyun. And um, before we start, um, I would like to say that uh, our representative from the Agency for Healthcare Research and, and Quality, Kamala Mistry, is unable to join us. Before we begin today's agenda, I'd like to take a moment to honor two monumental leaders in the newborn screening community. We're greatly saddened by the passing of Dr. Harry Hannon and Dr. Kwaku Ohene Frempong last week. As many of you know, Dr. Hannon has made a profound impact on the public health newborn screening system during his 41 years of service at the CDC and beyond. He has created the Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program at the CDC in 1978, which currently provides services to over 670 newborn screening laboratories across the US and in 88 countries. Dr. Hannon authored more than 250 scientific publications and served on over 30 national and international committees for laboratory issues. He co-authored standards for the World Health Organization for implementing newborn screening for congenital hypothyroidism and phenylketonuria in developing and developed countries. Over his career, he has received numerous awards and honors for his achievements, including the CDC Shepherd Awards, the Robert Guthrie Award, the Association of Public Health Laboratories Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Russell J. Eilers Award in 2008. In 2008, APHL created the Harry Hannon Laboratory Improvement Award in Newborn Screening, which commemorates Harry's longstanding contributions by honoring a person working worldwide who has made significant contributions to improving the quality of laboratory results in the newborn screening field. And I'd like to turn things over to um, Dr. Carla Cuthbert from the CDC, a longtime colleague of Harry Hannon's. Hmm. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, Harry Hannon, um, many of you would remember him, and he was many things to many people. And um, I'd like to just even start by just saying for those who knew him well, for those who, who rub shoulders with him um, and, and who had any kind of relationship with him, I am sorry for the loss that you yourself feel. Um, I am the chief of the newborn screening and molecular biology branch, and I can definitely say that the branch today, um, the support that we provide, the work that we do, the vision that we are able to develop uh, for the future to support programs, that would not exist were it not for Harry's insight. Harry, as you know, was a very strong advocate for newborn screening. And as a result of his leadership and vision at the CDC, he created uh, what we now, I don't wanna say that we take it for granted, that the newborn screening quality assurance program, it has been long with us. Um, and he did that while he was then chief of the newborn screening branch. This program, as Cindy has indicated, um, started off incredibly small and it's grown to, um, cover about 700 participating pr programs uh, in about 80, 88 countries. And at his funeral yesterday, um, if you had an opportunity to listen in, the pastor said that uh, Harry had done enough in his life and then he was called home. And so I appreciate a moment uh, to be able to, to honor Harry. And I do recognize that he's left an amazing legacy behind. And while we're very profoundly sad that he's no longer with us, we know that we are part of his legacy and that it is on his shoulders that we continue to create new programs, resources, and to support new, the newborn screening community, um, both uh, domestic and international. So thank you. Thank you, Carla. Dr. Kwaku Oheni Frempong dedicated his life and career to working with sickle cell disease in patients with this condition. Born in Ghana, his record of excellence as a student athlete earned him a scholarship to Yale to study pre-med, and he received his medical degree from the Yale School of Medicine. While finishing his degree, his son became the first baby diagnosed with sickle cell disease 
by Dr. Howard Pearson in the pioneering newborn screening program at Yale in 1972. His firsthand experience with sickle cell and newborn testing motivated him to dedicate his life and career to studying and advocating for sickle cell. Dr. Ohene Frempong was a leading pediatric sickle cell physician. He was director emeritus of the Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, emeritus professor of pediatrics at the Perelman Center of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and president of the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana. He pioneered a newborn screening and follow-up program in Ghana where one in 50 babies has sickle cell disease. We, this has been a training center for sickle cell care and research in Africa. Dr. Ohene Frempong also founded the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana and was a founding member of the Global Sickle Cell Disease Network. Dr. Hannon and Dr. Ohene Frempong will be greatly missed. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor them. Thank you. May I have the next slide, please? I also would like to take some time to acknowledge that this will be the last advisory committee, committee meeting for Dr. Scott Schoen and myself, whose terms will end in June. Dr. Schoen, on behalf of HRSA and the advisory committee, we thank you for your outstanding service and contributions to the committee and the field of newborn screening. You have dedicated countless hours to attend committee meetings, contributed to committee products, participated on the nomination and priority in lab standards and procedures work groups, and applied your in-depth subject matter expertise to community deliberations and decisions. As a token of our gratitude, we have sent an appreciation plaque to Dr. Schoen ahead of the meeting. If you have it there, you can show it. If not, that's okay. Um, also, there it is. <laughs> also, we will be sending a certificate and letter of appreciation from the HRSA administrator, Carol Johnson. I would now like to open the floor to Dr. Schoen to say a few words. Thanks, Dr. Powell. Always dangerous when you let me have an open mic. But um, I, serving on this committee has been just an absolute honor um, and really, I was talking to my wife last night, it was a career bucket list item uh, that I achieved way earlier than I ever anticipated. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, when I started in newborn screening, my training's in microbiology and immunology, and I was in bioterrorism uh, and finding it not rewarding and, and, and took an opportunity to move to newborn screening, um, where I found something that I'm incredibly passionate about. But I always tell the story of when I started in New Jersey, uh, the program there was having some challenges and they had just bought three new tandem mass spectrometers and the assistant secretary said to me, okay, we have three new mass specs, you need to validate them as your first job. And I said, okay, great. What's a mass spec and how do you validate it? And that was my introduction to newborn screening. Um, the good news was that three weeks later, the department had already requested an external review of the New Jersey program and in walked Gary Hoffman from Wisconsin Brad Therrell from the NSGRC and, uh, and Harry. And um, Harry was a tireless um, advocate and mentor and I miss him terribly. So um, it has been an honor to serve on this committee and um, contribute to the system. Um, my service is not done. <laughs> I don't retire for decades. So you're all gonna have to listen to me for a lot longer. So 
thank you everybody thank you dr powell for a few moments um and i wish my fellow committee members luck because um i hate to leave when the challenges just continue to crescendo but um i'm always here rooting for you all and um would be happy to serve in any role that you see i can fit in the future thanks thank you dr Schoen. Once again, thank you for your service you have made and continue to have a lasting impact on newborns and their families across the nation. For our first item of committee business, I'd like to announce that Dr. Margie Ream will, will replace Dr. Jennifer Kwan, who is now serving as a committee member as the organizational representative for the Child Neurology Society. Margie Reem is an assistant professor and child neurologist in the Department of Pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital, the Ohio State University College of Medicine. She has an extensive research background in fetal physiology and nervous system development, and this was the focus of her PhD thesis work. She has public policy experience and subject matter expertise regarding leukodystrophies and other rare genetic diseases as director of the leukodystrophy clinic at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She's a member of the Ohio Newborn Screening Advisory Council, a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children's Follow-Up and Treatment Work Group, and a co-investigator for the HRSA Evidence Review Group. As the provider of ne nearly all fetal neurology consultations at Nationwide Children's Hospital, Dr. Reem also has extensive contact with maternal fetal medicine specialists and neonatologists as they identify and develop postnatal treatment plans for infants with prenatal and neonatal diagnoses of genetic and metabolic brain disorders. Dr. Reem, we are excited to welcome you. Next slide. At the February 2022 meeting, the committee voted in favor of recommending adding MPS2 to the RUSP. Following the meeting, I have sent a letter to Secretary Becerra with the recommendation from the advisory committee. Committee members and organizational representatives received a copy of the letter in the briefing book, and for the public, a copy has been posted on the committee's website. Please remember that the secretary makes the final decision on whether or not to accept the committee's recommendation. This decision will be posted on the committee's website once it's available. As I mentioned at the February advisory committee meeting um, in October of 2021, the National CMV Foundation submitted a RUSP nomination package for congenital cytomegalovirus newborn screening. The nomination and prioritization work group is reviewing the nomination package for congenital cytomegalovirus and will keep both the nominators and the rest of the committee informed of next steps. Next slide. As announced at the February meeting, federal register notices have been published calling for nominations for new voting members and new organizational representatives. Both of those just closed and the nominations are currently under review. We will be reviewing the nominations for the voting members to ensure that the membership of the ACHDNC is fairly balanced in terms of points of view represented, represented and that it meets the requirements as outlined in the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, which include medical, technical, or scientific professionals with special expertise in the field of heritable disorders or in providing screening, counseling, testing, or specialty services for newborns and children with or at risk for having heritable disorders. Also, individuals who have expertise in ethics, infectious disease, and who have worked in published material in newborn screening and members of the public having demonstrated expertise or lived experience. Thank you to everyone who has submitted the nominations. Regarding capacity and prioritization, the committee had an initial discussion at the February meeting on its capacity to review multiple nominations per year. I had mentioned that I intend to form a work group comprised of current 
and former committee members and other subject matter experts to develop criteria and a process for prioritizing the review of nominated conditions. This work is currently in the contracting phase, and we expect the work in this area to begin in 2022. This will be further discussed at an upcoming committee meeting. Next slide, please. Thank you committee members and organizational representatives for reviewing the February 2022 meeting summary. Are there any other corrections to the meeting summary before we vote? Is there a motion to vote on whether or not to approve the February 2022 ACHDNC meeting summary? This is Kyle Brother, so moved. Is there a second? This is Sean McCandless, I second. Is there any discussion of the motion? Hearing none, committee members, when I call your name, please state yes. If you are in favor of approving the February meeting summary, no, if you are not in favor of approving the summary, or you may also abstain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kamala Mystery from Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is not able to attend this meeting. We'll go next to Kyle Brothers. Yes from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Carla Cuthbert. Yes. Jane DeLuca. Yes. From the Food and Drug Administration, Kelly Kelm. Yes. From Health Resources and Services Administration, Michael Warren. Yes. Sean McCandless. Yes. Jennifer Kwan. Yes. From the NIH, Melissa Parisi. Yes. Shanika Ponpitkun. Yes. Cynthia Powell, I vote yes, and Scott Schoen. Yes. Thank you. The February 2022 ACHDNC meeting summary has been approved. Thank you, committee members. May I have the next slide, please? So the um, committee will meet today, May 12th, and tomorrow, May 13th. Here are the meeting topics for today. First, we will have an expert panel presenting on updates on homocystinuria newborn screening. Next, we will have the first public comment session of the meeting where we will hear from seven individuals, including Danae Bartke from HCU Network America, Terry Klein from the National MPS Society, Dylan Simon from Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, Dean Soar from MLD Foundation, Kim Stevens from Project Alive. We will also hear from Kim Tuminello and Heidi Wallace, who have registered to provide public comments on the committee vote on guanidino acetate, methyltransferase, or GAMP deficiency. Then the evidence-based review group will provide an overview of the evidence-based review for GAMP deficiency. Afterwards, committee liaisons to the evidence-based review group, Dr. Jane DeLuca and Dr. Sean McCandless will prevent, present the committee report on newborn screening for GAMP deficiency. At approximately 2.50, the committee is scheduled to begin the vote on whether or not to recommend GAMP deficiency for inclusion on the recommended uniform screening panel. We will end today at 3.20 Eastern time and reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Next slide, please. Tomorrow, Friday, May 13th, the committee will begin with the second public comments period where we will hear from Nikki Armstrong from Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, Richard Poulin from Special Education Teaching and Learning, Inc., and five individuals who will provide public comments on the committee vote on Crab A disease, including uh, Jack Jackie Wagner, Natasha Spencer, Carlita Blackwell, Joanne Kurtzberg, and Dieter Matern. Following the public comment period, the nomination and prioritization work group will provide a summary of the nomination package for Crab A disease. 
immediately after the nomination and prioritization work group presentation, the committee will have an opportunity to discuss the nomination package and hold a vote on whether or not to move Crab A disease forward to full evidence-based review. The last session tomorrow will be a presentation from the Newborn Screening Family Education Program. We will aim to adjourn the meeting at approximately 12.40 p.m. Eastern time. I'll now turn things back over to Sue Young. Thank you. And for the record, uh, Susan Tanksley from Association of Public Health Laboratories and Robert Ostrander from American Academy of Family Physicians are present. Uh, so for members of the public, audio will come through your computer speakers, so please make sure that you have your speakers turned on. If you cannot access the audio through your computer, you may dial into the meeting using the telephone number in the email with your Zoom link. As mentioned previously, this meeting will not have an all attendee chat feature, but we do have the public comment period scheduled later today. Committee members and org reps, audio will come from your computer speakers and you'll be able to speak using your computer microphone. If you cannot access the audio micro or microphone through your computer, you may dial into the meeting using the telephone number in the email with your user specific Zoom link. Please remember to speak clearly and remember to state your first and last name to ensure proper recording for the committee transcript and minutes. The chair will call on committee members and then organizational representatives. In order to best better facilitate the discussion, we remind you to use the raise hand feature when you would like to make comments or ask questions. Simply click on the participant icon and choose raise hand. Please note that depending on your device or operating system, the raise hand feature may be in a different location. To troubleshoot, please consult the webinar instructions page in your briefing book. Next slide, please. To enable closed captioning, please select the closed captioning icon on, from your Zoom taskbar and then select show title from the menu that appears. Thank you, back to Dr. Powell. Thank you, Suyun. In 2019, the committee received public comments from the Home Assistant Area or HCU Network America about the low sensitivity of newborn screening for homocystinuria. They estimated at the time that up to 50% of cases may be missed and the committee discussed following up on how to address this issue. I have invited three speakers today to provide us with an overview of the current status of HCU newborn screening and updates possible solutions to the challenges with HCU screening and any advances in the screening technology. Our first presenter is Dr. Marzia Pasquale, who will provide us with an overview of the status of newborn screening for homocystinuria. Dr. Pasquale is a professor of pathology, the program director of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education Accredited Fellowship Program in Clinical Biochemical Genetics at the University of Utah School of Medicine and the Section Chief and Medical Director of Biochemical Genetics at ARUP Laboratories. Dr. Pasquale earned her degrees of Doctor in Pharmaceutical Chemistry and Technology and Pharmacy Doctor at the University of Parma School of Pharmacy in Italy. She trained in Clinical Biochemical Genetics at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where she later served as the co-director of the Biochemical Genetics Laboratory. Dr. Pasquale is board certified in clinical biochemical genetics. She is a member of the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and several other professional societies. Her research interests are newborn screening, disorders of carnitine and creatine metabolism and transport, and lysosomal storage disorders. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Pasquale. Thank you, Dr. Powell, for the introduction. Today, um, uh, I will talk about homocystinuria. Next slide. I will uh, we'll, uh, talk, uh, give a brief introduction of uh, homocystinuria and the biochemical uh, pattern. 
uh, clinical description of classic homocystinuria, and then uh, I will briefly introduce the newborn screening, uh, how it's uh, currently done. Next slide. Homocystinurias are a group of disorders characterized by elevated homocysteine and often elevated homocysteine. The difference between homocysteine and homocysteine is that homocysteine is uh, formed by um, attaching to homocysteine molecules. Only one to two percent of total homocysteine is present is present as such. The rest uh, um, is bound to protein through a disulfide bond, or is present as a dimer free homocysteine. Again, you can see um, that there are two molecules of homocysteine uh, that are bound together. When we look at plasma uh, amino acid analysis, so what we are measuring, we are measuring this uh, dimer, the free homocysteine, which accounts uh, for uh, only about 10% of the total homocysteine. If you want to measure total homocysteine, you need uh, an additional step, an additional chemical reaction that reduces the disulfide bond, breaks uh, this bond, uh, and breaks uh, this uh, dimer into the two homocysteine molecules. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows uh, the metabolic pathways uh, uh, of uh, sulfur amino acid. We can see three, the three major pathways, remethylation, transfer of the metal group, uh, and the transsulfuration. If we start from methionine, there is uh, uh, a series of enzymatic reactions that are uh, uh, transferring the methyl group from methionine to other molecules, such as guanidino acetate to synthesize the creatine or glycine to synthesize the sarcosine. And uh, form, uh, um, it, with this series of reactions, methionine is converted to homocysteine. Homocysteine is then converted to cystathionine by the action of the enzyme cystathionine beta synthase, which uses uh, B6, vitamin B6, pyridoxine as a cofactor. Then homocysteine is remethylated to form methionine again by a series of uh, um, reaction and cofactor, including uh, um, vitamin B12, to again, uh, going back to methionine. In uh, disorders uh, of uh, homocysteine remethylation, those that are uh, on uh, the left of the screen in the green box, um, the characteristic marker will be elevated total homocysteine, elevated homocysteine, and the low methionine. Because again, the remethylation of homocysteine to methionine is impaired. In disorder of the metal group transfer, um, we are gonna see markedly elevated methionine with uh, either normal or mildly elevated total homocysteine and normal homocysteine. In the cystathionine data synthase deficiency, which is uh, uh, in the blue box at the bottom, uh, we are going to see markedly elevated methionine, elevated, markedly elevated total homocysteine, and elevated homocysteine as well. Next slide. So there are uh, mainly four biochemical markers that are necessary for the diagnosis of homocystinuria. Methionine, which is uh, elevated in cystathionine beta synthase deficiency and low in uh, disorder of homocysteine remethylation. Total homocysteine and free homocysteine, which are elevated in both disorder of remethylation and in cystathionine beta synthase deficiency. And then we also have a methamalonic acid, which is elevated in disorder of vitamin B12 metabolism 
which impair uh, homocysteine remethylation and methylmalonic acid metabolism. Next slide. So let me uh, let's talk now about classic homocysteinuria. Classic homocysteinuria is caused by deficiency in cystathionine beta synthase, which is uh, an enzyme requiring uh, vitamin B6 and results in elevated methionine and elevated uh, homocysteine and the homocysteine. The incidence uh, um, calculated uh, by newborn screening, um, this is a paper uh, um, published in 2014, looking at 10 years of newborn screening. The incidence was one in 456,000 newborns, but the estimated prevalence is one in 200,000 to one in 335,000. This indicates that newborn screening can, can miss cases of uh, uh, classic homocystinuria. Classic homocystinuria is inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. Um, the diagnosis is accomplished through newborn screening, and currently the marker, the primary marker, is elevated methionine. Plasma amino acid will show elevated methionine and presence of free homocysteine. Total plasma homocysteine is usually markedly elevated and usually is uh, even greater than uh, 100 micromolar with a normal range that's less than 12. The diagnosis is confirmed by DNA sequencing. The therapy consists in a low protein diet with an amino acid mixture that does not contain methionine, pyridoxine in a responsive patient, betaine to favor homocysteine remethylation, and methylfolate and vitamin B12, which help uh, again uh, in the remethylation process. Next slide. What is the clinical presentation of classic homocystinuria? Uh, uh, we have a manifestation um, to the eye and patients have a show lens dislocation and or severe myopia. Skeletal system is involved as well. These patients usually have a tall stature with long uh, limbs, long arms and uh, legs, scoliosis and uh, um, osteoporosis. Thromboembolism uh, is uh, a characteristic of uh, this condition and the developmental delay and intellectual disability. Thromboembolism is the major cause of early death and morbidity in uh, um, patients who are not uh, treated. And uh, it's uh, um, manifest in late childhood and young adults which is not uh, uh, the, the age group where uh, we typically can observe thromboembolism, uh, thrombotic episodes. There is uh, a milder phenotype, which is a uh, responsive homocystinuria. The majority of infants identified by newborn screening currently are B6 non-responsive. And this is this because it's rare for a B6 responsive uh, patient to have a methionine elevated. And when I say that methionine elevated, I mean methionine above the decision limit or the cutoff that has been established by the newborn screening lab. So it's rare for a B6 responsive infant to have methionine elevated at the time of the first newborn screen, which is collected uh, between 24 and 48 hours of life. Complications of homocystinuria can be prevented by early identification and treatment. And therefore, newborn screening, a sensitive newborn screening program is necessary. Next slide. How is the newborn screening done currently? Well, we all know tandem mass spectrometry is universally used, and uh, the sensitivity of the newborn screening for homocystinuria depends upon the choice of 
markers and uh, the choice of decision limit. Methionine is the primary market and again, may not be above the cutoff in classic homocystinuria, especially for the B6 responsive variants. Therefore, classic homocystinuria may be missed. Ratio can be used as a secondary markers to increase the sensitivity. And one example of the ratio could be methionine phenylalanine ratio. Next slide. Um, other causes of, there are other causes of elevated methionine in newborn screening, which increase the noise of the screening. Um, these are high protein diet. It's not very common, but in our experience, we have seen uh, infants with elevated methionine on newborn screening because they were fed a high protein diet. Low birth weight prematurity, again, in our experience, uh, one third of infants with elevated methionine were premature. Liver disease, uh, deficiency of the enzymes which are involved in the transfer of the methyl group will result in elevated methionine. And then uh, citrine deficiency, also known as citrullinemia type 2 and tyrosinemia type 1, are conditions so that can result in elevated methionine. Next slide. So how do we reduce the noise? We can use a second tier test. Second tier tests are tests that are run on the same sample used for the primary screen. So there is no need to recollect the sample, but uh, targeting a different uh, analyze. And the purpose again is to identify infants at risk to have a metabolic disease while reducing the false positive and also reducing the false negative. Next slide. What is the strategy for a second tier test? Well, because uh, um, the noise uh, is uh, introduced uh, by the fact that the marker of a specific condition may be elevated also due to different causes. So the strategy would be to identify specific markers for the condition. In case of homocystinuria, the specific marker would be total homocysteine. Um, there are also molecular second-year tests, but in this case, a biochemical second-year test is going to be much more effective. Dr. Maturm and Dr. Petritis are going to talk about uh, second-tier tests and their effectiveness. Next slide. I'm just uh, going to end uh, my presentation with uh, um, a summary of the recommendation for newborn screening for homocystinuria that were published uh, three years ago on the Journal for Inherited Metabolic Disorder and the recommendation were to revise the decision limit and um, uh, with reference to the median, use a combination of markers, so like methionine and uh, or uh, the ratio methionine to melanin, use post-analytical tools, um, again, uh, which will help reduce the noise and implementation of second-year tests. Next slide. In summary, newborn screening for classic homocystinuria is possible and can be effective. The primary marker currently used is not sensitive to detect all cases, and we need the more sensitive and specific markers. Multiple markers increase the sensitivity of the screening. Second-year tests are effective in reducing the number of false positive and false negative, but they can be a burden to newborn screening laboratory. And the use of bioinformatic tools can help identifying samples needing the second-year test and decreasing the burden to newborn screening laboratories. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pasquale. The committee will hold questions and comments until after all panelists have presented. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Dita Matern, who will discuss the possible and available solutions to the HCU newborn screening problem. 
Dr. Matern is a professor of laboratory medicine, medical genetics and pediatrics, and co-director of the Biochemical Genetics Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Matern's research activities involve the development and improvement of laboratory assays for the effective and efficient screening, diagnosis, and follow-up of patients with inborn errors of metabolism. He has also participated in the laboratory evaluation of animal models and clinical trials as a collaborator with colleagues at Mayo Clinic and other academic institutions. He authored or co-authored more than 160 peer-reviewed publications and 21 textbook chapters. Dr. Matern currently serves on several committees, boards, and working groups of the Minnesota Department of Health, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the College of American Pathologists, the Association of Public Health Laboratories, the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, and patient advocacy organizations. From 2011 to 2018, he served as a member of this committee, the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Matern. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the very kind introduction and for inviting me back to the committee and talk to you about homocystinuria's newborn screening problem and what are possible and available solutions. Next slide, please. So as you heard before, um, uh, methionine uh, is easy to measure. Uh, everyone uses tandem mass spectrometry to do so, but it is not sensitive even with a low cutoff. And as this graph shows, it's also not very specific because there is a significant overlap between uh, methionine values in babies treated with total parental nutrition and um, uh, those that have homocystinuria. I was made aware of the issue in 1999 when Harvey Levy and others published uh, this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, pointing out that there's a significant problem of missing uh, babies with homocystinuria when using methionine as a primary marker. Next slide. Uh, also uh, in uh, uh, 2007, um, uh, when uh, tandem mass spectrometry was introduced into newborn screening programs, this Dutch group pointed out the problem of uh, TPN and some TPN solutions that included a lot of methionine and causing problems with screening for homocystinuria. Next slide, please. As Dr. Pasquale already mentioned, a proposed solution has been uh, made that you might want to just add a ratio such as methionine to phenylalanine, which is again easy to measure when you use tandem mass spec and you get both values for methionine and phenylalanine. Uh, but the problem here is again that it is not sufficiently sensitive and also not uh, specific. As you can see in that uh, graph, TPN again overlaps quite a bit uh, with uh, patients with homocystering just for the methionine to phenylalanine ratio. Next slide, please. As also was mentioned, uh, molecular uh, testing is often uh, thrown into the mix as uh, solving the newborn screening problems. But if you look just a few days ago in ClinVar, 974 variants in the cystathionine beta synthase gene are listed there. And of those, only 27% are of known significance, which means that the rest, 714 variants currently, we don't really know exactly what they might be doing. So if you actually have a genotype, the chances that you have a uh, not so certain variant included in the genotype is quite high. Next slide, please. The other proposed solution that which you will hear in the next talk is to just measure total homocysteine as a primary screen, replacing basically methionine. And that would probably work very well, as you can see here, because patients with homocystinuria, as you just heard also before, have really high total homocysteine. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Petritis and uh, uh, Carla Cuthbert and others at the CDC published uh, a feasibility study uh, using a new technology uh, to do so. Next slide, please. But I think what Dr. Petritis will tell you, this is not quite ready for prime time. Next slide, please. But there is currently a solution available, and that is to measure total homocysteine as part of a second tier test. It's sensitive, 
It requires additional technology in the laboratory, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, uh, but it can be regionalized. So not every screening program has to do this because homocystinuria, as you know, is not a time critical condition. So sending a specimen overnight to another laboratory to do the testing is not a problem. And for homocystinuria, homocystinuria you could even batch the analysis of doing it only twice a week or so. And you can add additional markers. So when we published this for the first time in 2010, uh, we actually uh, developed an assay where we measured total homocysteine, methylmalonic acid, and 2-methyl citric acid um, to uh, support um, newborn screening for homocystinuria and other conditions. This test uh, is not unique to Mayo Clinic. So not, you, you don't have to be the Mayo Clinic to do this test. As published only last year, uh, a lab in uh, Spain implemented the test. And in between, there were other papers doing the same. Next slide, please. So when would you use this test? Again, if you include more than total homocysteine, such as methylmalonic acid and 2-methyl citric acid, you can use it actually when you have elevations of C3 acylcarnitine to differentiate between false positives and propionic acidemia and methylmalonic acidemias when methionine is elevated, but also when methionine is reduced. Next slide. Because there are remethylation disorders that also deserve identification through newborn screening, because as in this paper was shown, uh, these conditions are treatable, but the patients benefit when this treatment is initiated early, making a case for newborn screening. So overall, about one to 2% would deserve the second tier test or require the second tier test based on a high C3 acylconitine or high or low methionine. Next slide, please. We published recently uh, our experience with this second tier test. And as you can see in that table, there are multiple conditions that are indicated by high C3 or high or low methionine that can be uh, better determined using the second tier test. And most importantly, you can reduce false positives and exclude total parental nutrition. Next slide, please. We have done this now between 2012 and 2019 in that time frame, more than 5,600 times. And as you can see, we found 44 babies with, which had an isolated homocysteine elevation. So these patients had homocystinuria. Next slide. What's a second tier test? So in my opinion, it's a cost-effective approach to reduce false positive results in cases like homocystinuria, where you have the problem of overlap with a poorly specific and sensitive marker. You do it after the primary screen. You don't ask for another specimen, no additional patient contact. You use the original newborn screening blood spot. And when the second tier test is normal, it overrules the primary screen. That's how we reduce false positives. And there are plenty of examples out there where this is being done biochemically, but the best known is probably biomolecular in CF um, uh, screening. Next slide, please. So what happens at the birth plate, a sample is collected. Next slide, the specimen goes to the screening lab. They do their primary screen. And in most instances, everything is fine and everyone is happy. Next click. However, if it's abnormal, often a repeat is requested, the testing is done again, it could be abnormal again, and then you finally get to confirmatory testing. I don't think that's a good idea. It wastes time, it wastes effort, it creates anxiety in the families and um, uh, a lot of work for the follow-up uh, people. Next slide, please. So when you have a second tier test, you take another punch, you do that. It's, in most instances, it's normal, everyone should be happy. If it is abnormal, next slide, then you can go right to confirmatory testing and the physician can tell the family with good confidence that this is most likely a true positive result and requires uh, action. Next slide, please. So when we did newborn screening uh, using tandem mass spec for the state of Minnesota, uh, in the time frame from April, 2005, when we started using our second tier tests through December, 2011, um, if we had not used the second tier test, but applied the same rules to use the second tier test, we would have had 10,900 false positives among half a million babies, which is 2%. And the follow-up cost calculated based on 2012 uh, cost data and using the ACMG uh, act sheet and algorithm to determine what kind of work is required to follow up on an abnormal screening result 
it would have cost the state $9.3 million. However, we did have a second tier test. Next slide, please. And with the second tier test, we had 31 false positives and a follow-up cost of $400,000 and basically could save uh, almost $9 million to the healthcare system in Minnesota. Next slide, please. If we extrapolate this to 4 million babies born in the US, the false positives again would be 2.2%. Uh, the total follow-up cost based on the 2012 data, so not based on 2022 data where it would be likely much higher would be $74 million. And next slide, please. With a second tier test, if it was applied across the US, we could save $71 million in 2012, probably $100 million today in healthcare cost. Next slide, please. So in summary, newborn screening for homocystinuria is currently hampered by the marker methionine. Uh, there is a solution currently available using the second year test. It's efficient, effective, and it is accessible. Um, and it can identify most cases with homocystinuria if you really wanted to do this. Every state says we're screening for homocystinuria, but are we really? Total, total homocysteine may be added in a new screening assay in the future, and you will hear about that. And I think it's also, we, as I hope to have showed you, we could reduce unnecessary healthcare spending uh, if we really considered newborn screening as a system and not compartmentalized. The issue that we often hear is why screening labs do not want to use a second tier test that is done outside or even inside their own walls is because they don't have the funding to do the testing in-house and they don't have the permission to send out samples or create additional costs by sending it out because people do not look at newborn screening as a system and that we can save for the overall healthcare system and not just for a single laboratory. With next slide, uh, with that, I'm done. And I really would like to acknowledge everyone in my laboratory and um, specifically our genetic counselors and my colleagues uh, uh, running the laboratory. And I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, Dr. Matern. <clears throat> our last panelist is Dr. Kostas Petridis, who will give us an update on advances in HCU newborn screening detection. Dr. Petridis received his Master of Science and PhD degrees in analytical chemistry from the University of Orléans, France. In 2002, he joined Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington as a postdoctoral fellow and later as a senior staff scientist where he worked in the field of mass spectrometry based proteomics. In 2009, Dr. Petridis was hired as an associate professor and laboratory head of the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, to work on biomarker development. In 2014, he joined the Arizona Office of Newborn Screening and Phoenix Children's Hospital as a principal investigator, where he led several federal public health and research grants before joining the CDC in June of 2017. He has worked on bioanalytical mass spectrometry, biomarker development, automation, predictive algorithms, and proteomic research. His current interests include, but are not limited to advanced analytical methods development and validation for newborn screening, development of dried blood spots based quality assurance materials and calibrators, clinical assays, harmonization, and metabolomics. He has co-authored more than 200 communications. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Petridis. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, so this is the outline of my presentation for today. I will start by presenting a slide um, on current analytical practices for almost urea screening in newborns. Uh, following for some, um, describing some work uh, towards a universal secondary screening assay for biochemical newborn screening biomarkers, including uh, homocysteine. And then I will describe some uh, proof of concept work that we did uh, on combining first the secondary screening biomarker using separation before uh, analysis by tandem mass spectrometry. And finally, the majority of my presentation will focus uh, in our efforts towards multiplex homocysteine detection in primary flow injection analysis, tandem mass spectrometry screen. Next slide, please. 
So as you heard already twice, uh, methionine is currently used as a biomarker in primary newborn screening for homocytorrhea. Unfortunately, it has poor sensitivity and sensitive specificity. Total homocysteine is the most specific marker for homocytorrhea, but uh, currently it's only used as a second tier screening marker following a presumptive positive methionine elevation primary screening. Now, as uh, Dr. Martin showed uh, and Dr. Pasquale, uh, there are second tier screening methods out there, either for only to measure total homocysteine or multiplexing, mainly with organic acids. Now, generally speaking, uh, I want to mention that uh, second tier screening assays are very fragmented. Many of them uh, is just uh, one assay for one disease. You have like uh, one second tier screening assay for uh, adrenoleucal dystrophy, one for Crohn's disease, one for MSGD one for um, congenital adrenal uh, hyperplasia. And I feel this is one of the reasons that um, that has uh, led to low adoption rates for in-house secondary screening. So too many assays to maintain. Um, uh, and some other reasons is that some of the assays have relatively low reflex rates. So you may have only you know, one specimen to analyze per, uh, per week, uh, but you still have to maintain the method uh, make standards, run calibrators and QCs before you run one specimen or two. Uh, uh, other reasons that uh, have been mentioned is the need of a separate mass spectrometry instrument and delays in reporting. As Dr. Martin saw, uh, mentioned, um, regional second tier screening is a possibility. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to overcome some of those limitations, we ask ourselves, can we just take all of those second tier screen biomarkers and just make one assay and be able to analyze all of them? And we also saw an opportunity with the introduction of adrenaleucodystrophy in the recommended uniform screening panel, because uh, as you know, adrenaleucodystrophy is using mainly flow injection analysis at the mass spectrometry to analyze uh, 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 lysophosphate lysophosphatide Collins uh, C26, uh, and uh, there are like a lot of uh, high false positives that require second tier screening. So some states uh, uh, reflects up to 3% of their daily specimens to second tier screening for ALD. So the idea was like, uh, okay, let's take uh, LPC26 uh, and uh, try to multiplex with all uh, the other uh, uh, biomarkers for disease that have a lower reflex rate and come up with an assay that uh, can generate actually enough specimens uh, every day in the laboratory to justify to do secondary screening in-house daily. And this is what we came up uh, with. Uh, so we have a method, uh, uh, it multiplexes uh, about 19 uh, secondary screening biomarkers, including homocysteine that's shown here in red, and uh, LPC26, uh, 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 organic acids, um, uh, LPCs, leucine, isomers, and other analytes of interest. So in order to achieve that, we use hydrophilic interaction chromatography coupled to the mass spectrometry, and we have validated this assay in-house. We have the manuscript, it's currently in clearance, um, and it will be uh, uh, soon submitted uh, to analytical chemistry. Next slide, please. Uh, as Dr. Martin said, uh, we also did some uh, proof of concept work where we said, uh, well, let's try actually to combine first the second tier screening analytes uh, using separation before mass spectrometry. And for this uh, work, we used uh, on chip electrophoretic separations that are like extremely fast. You can see from the figure, I don't know if you can see, but uh, the separation window here is uh, 0.8 to 1.4 minutes, uh, so very high peak capacities. Uh, you can do your acyl things, you can do the amino acids, and at the same time, you can do your secondary screening analytes, including homocysteine, that is shown here in red. And you can even uh, um, achieve uh, baseline separations for very difficult uh, to separate analytes like leucine, isoleucine, and alloisoleucine, so biomarker for MSUD. There are some limitations, uh, so, uh, there is an inability to analyze organic acids, which is inherent to this uh, method. We couldn't do LPC. 
and some other cycle time or considerations. All of those limitations are described um, into our recently published paper in clinical chemistry in December of 2021. Um, but uh, so as Dr. Matter said, this particular assay is not ready for prime time, but it showed uh, a kind of what you can do currently with separations before mass spectrometry analysis. Next slide, please. So I will transition now talking uh, my, for the main topic of my presentation, which is actually multiplex total homocysteine into primary flow injection analysis study mass spectrometry. So as we had to ice, one of the complications and challenges is that the reducing step is required to be able to quantify total homocysteine. That's because more than 98% of homocysteine is either oxidized with itself or it's bound to proteins. So we didn't need a reducing agent to be able to clip the disulfide bond and make total uh, homocysteine detection feasible. So when we start this work, uh, you know, we had no idea of the challenges that we were gonna face. There was nothing published in the literature, of course. Um, so, you know, we had no idea, you know, are there gonna be interference with total homocysteine during flow injection analysis at the mass spectrometry? What is gonna be the impact of reducing agents on other biomarkers? Are there some solvent extraction issues or workflow considerations? We needed to respond to all of that. Next slide, please. So if you look at the literature, there are currently two common disulfide bond reducing agents. One is DTT, the other is T7. DTT, and I saw the structures here, has actually two free thiol groups, which is important uh, for something that I will say later. A T7 doesn't. So DTT is the most commonly used in liver screening papers. It's a reversible reaction, uh, the reduction that uh, you can get with DTT, and does not ionize in positive mode uh, mass spectrometry, which is good. Uh, on the other hand, TSEP is a stronger reducing agent. It has better stability. Uh, it has been reporting that it can form byproducts uh, with heating. It does ionize in uh, positive uh, ion mode mass spectrometry. And we saw some interesting research paper where uh, there is actually potential for post-reaction removal if you bind uh, TSEP with uh, magnetic nanoparticles. So you can do the reaction and then eliminate the TSEP from your solution. Next slide, please. So first of all, we want to see if there are any identification of uh, any, any interference with the uh, homocysteine. We thought that maybe we will be lucky and there will be none. So in order to see if there are any, we took just a specimen that is with um, homocysteine. We uh, did our sample prep, um, non-derivatized one. Um, and we looked at high resolution mass spectrometry to be able to see are there any uh, uh, interference at the transition 136 to 90, which is what we use for total homocysteine. And you can see that there were like uh, several uh, interference and we identified the major ones, which actually were uh, coming from us using uh, internal standards that uh, interfere with total homocysteine uh, uh, transition. So one of them is the methanin D3. D3 stands for uh, deuterium, which substitutes hydrogen. The mass for this one uh, to charge ratio is 153, but it fragments in source to create another anion at 136, which is a paranine for homocysteine. And then the fragment anion, same with leucine, you can see it here. Um, the monoisotopic uh, ion interferes with uh, homocysteine detection. And then there are some other minor interferences around. So this is actually all those different ions that you can see here with high resolution mass spectrometry. You wouldn't, it, they will all come under one peak because of the unit resolution of uh, triple quads that are using uh, newborn screening. So we had to come up with another way to solve this problem. And uh, we thought that uh, maybe we should try specific tile derivatization to shift the total homocysteine, the homocysteine transition from 136 to something higher that hopefully is not gonna interfere with other compounds. 
Now, just a reminder that homocysteine currently is the only human screening biomarker that uh, has a free thiol. So if we do thiol derivatization, uh, homocysteine will be the only uh, compound that is uh, affected. Uh, next slide, please. So we tried several thiol derivatization agents and we ended up using n ethyl maleamide, which I will refer to it as uh, NEM from now on. So NEM reacts with any free thiol group that uh, includes, of course, homocysteine, but uh, DDT as well, because as you remember, I had, we had, uh, it has two free thiol groups. NEM shifts uh, the homocysteine transition from 136 to 90 to 261 to 56. You can see here uh, in this uh, figure how it works. We put homocysteine and NEM in solution, and it forms this new entity, homocysteine NEM. It has a mass to charge ratio of two, uh, 261. And you further fragment it in the second quadrupole, and you end up with very clean spectra, just two fragments, 56 and 215. And we use the 56, which is a major fragment. Uh, then we, we looked a little bit at the effect of the two different uh, reagents, uh, reducing reagents. So DTT, we saw that uh, it uh, reacts with NEM. And although DTT does not, uh, you cannot see in positive ion mode, uh, this complex, you can it ionize very well in tandem mass spectrometry uh, and creates a lot of ion suppression for all the other analytes. And we saw some evidence that there is also some um, reaction with acylcarnithines. So at that point, we said, okay, we are not gonna pursue DTT as a, as a reducing agent from now on, and we are just gonna use uh, TSEP instead. Next slide, please. So this is the updated sample preparation with the TSEP and EM protocol. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into details on it. Uh, I'm just gonna say, what you can see in blue, these are like the two additional steps that we added. One uh, where we add 12 microliter of 30 millimolar TSEP and set for five minutes in room temperature to perform the reduction. And then later in the sample prep, we add 40 microliters of 40 millimolar NEM and set for another five minutes in order to derivatize uh, homocysteine. Next slide, please. So the method actually it's uh, uh, validated right now, but we have preliminary findings that we can share with you. So we saw that selective derivatization with NEM increases total homocysteine signal by three to four times. Linearity is great from two to about 120 micromolar per liter. That's a range that we tested, uh, which is include, uh, it's great because it includes all the reference range and the disease range for uh, 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 precision experiments have finished, total homocysteine passed uh, with a relative standard deviation of less than 11.3%, limits of quantitation at 2.8 micromolar per liter, and no interference detected for a total homocysteine. We use the same uh, uh, high resolution mass spectrometry to confirm that uh, we don't see any interferences. So effect on other analytes, which is also important. So we saw that TSEP and NEM increase the ion suppression overly, but there's still enough sensitivity for all analytes to be detected. And actually the internal standards compensate for this ion suppression, as you can see the next slide. So C51 was the only analyte that was highly uh, uh, affected um, with, um, but C51 uses a, a surrogate internal standard. So we are currently uh, uh, synthesizing C51, label C51 to see if we can um, uh, mitigate that. So we did uh, a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison between the two methods. Our current method, which multiplexes amino acid, acid countings, succinylacetone, with this new method, the t 7 em that uh, multiplex homocysteine as well. And uh, you can see the results uh, in this graph. So uh, it's, everything is compared actually to our current method. Um, 
which is uh, uh, can be seen here by this dotted line. So if there were no chains, uh, all the other analytes are falling around the dotted line. And uh, with the exception of C5-1, you can see that every other analyte is within plus minus 20% of our QN method. Uh, and if you look closely, you will see the ones that are at about 20% uh, uh, higher are things that uh, don't have uh, its own internal standard and they use a surrogate internal standard like uh, C3DC and C4OH, C14-1, um, C1808, all of those um, are uh, uh, at about 20%. Everything else is within this 20% um, um, uh, range. And for even for those uh, analytes that I just mentioned, uh, they actually passed precision criteria during validation. So all you have to do is slightly um, modify your cutoff to account for this slight change. The only analyte that didn't pass our uh, precision criteria was C51. Next slide, please. So of course we wanted to try our method with uh, a newborn screening specimens. So we reached uh, out uh, to Texas, newborn screening, and we asked them for some uh, normal specimens, some specimens uh, from babies that were administered with total parental nutrition, and then some, uh, as many as they could afford uh, confirm homocystinuria specimens. So they gave us two of them, which were actually very interesting specimens because um, they came from babies that were missed on the first screen, but uh, they were uh, actually identified on the second screen based on the thionine measurements. As a reminder, Texas is the two screen state, so they collect uh, two specimens per baby. Uh, so as you can see here from the Texas first the screen results, Methionine concentration for these two babies, it was in the low 50s to low 60s. And while the methionine cutoff, the average between the US newborn screening labs, it's about 74. So if you're not doing second tier screening, probably your uh, cutoffs are lower than uh, um, this uh, particular first tier screening uh, results. And, uh, probably the babies would be missed uh, at birth. So unfortunately, actually we would have loved to, to, to analyze those first screen specimens, but they were not available. So we were provided uh, the second screen specimens. And uh, this figure shows the results um, of uh, all this analysis. So on the X axis, you can see the methionine concentration uh, at the uh, micromole, uh, y-axis, total homocysteine concentration. Uh, and these lines represent uh, uh, cutoffs just for visualization. So we have methionine cutoff, uh, which we use the average of US newborn screen lab uh, for methionine and total homocysteine cutoff, which is actually the one percentile uh, of uh, homocysteinuria disease. And the source is clear. So you can see green, it's all the normal specimens. On the left bottom side of the figure, they're all clustered together. They have low total homocysteine and low methionine. You can see that uh, TPN specimens, uh, they, have, uh, they can have very high values of methionine, uh, but uh, low total homocysteine. None of them passes our cutoffs. And only the confirmed homocysteinuria specimens had a really high uh, almost total homocysteine concentrations, and they were uh, uh, able to be identified with um, this method. So newborn screening specimens work really well with this method, so we're pretty happy with that. Next slide, please. So to sum everything up, as you already heard, uh, homocysteine, it's a more clinically relevant screening biomarker for mosquitoria than methionine. It should be included into almost in urea screening algorithms. Uh, we feel that um, if we multiplex uh, LPC C26 with organic acid and amino acids in one assay, we can uh, generate enough specimens for daily in-house use. 
uh, we demonstrated some proof of concepts where uh, you can actually analyze first year, second year uh, analytes by using separation between before analysis by tandem spectrometry. And we feel that this could play a significant role in the future, especially as more and more disorders are added into the RASP. And uh, some of those biomarkers will need to be multiplexed with um, amino acid and acid chemicals. And finally, uh, we are uh, able to come up with a novel assay, which is multiplex homocysteine into primary flow ejection mine analysis study mass spectrometry. And it could, uh, we hope, streamline the use of homocysteine uh, as a screening marker for mosturia in a similar way that succinyl acetone uh, multiplexing did for tyrosinemia type 1 disorder. Next slide, please. Last but not least, uh, uh, this work wouldn't be possible without my colleagues at CDC, especially Austin uh, did most of the work uh, that I'm presenting today, that analysis and visualization included. Um, Matthew was the person that did most of the development of the second tier screening uh, method, uh, and some math contributed in several projects. I would also like to thank my boss, Dr. Carla Cuthbert, for allowing us to work on those, all those uh, exciting projects and uh, giving us resources to do so. And of course, uh, Patricia Hahn and Susan Tanksley from the Texas Newborn Screening Laboratory for sharing those residual newborn screening uh, dried blood spot and allow us to validate our assays. And next slide. That's it. Thank you. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Drs. Pasquale, Matern, and Petridis for your excellent presentations. Um, we have time for a few uh, comments or questions. Um, we'll take these first from committee members and or then organizational representatives. Please use the raised hand feature in Zoom when you'd like to make comments or ask a question. And please remember to unmute yourself and state your first and last names. Sean McCandless. Um, thank you to all the speakers. That was really interesting. And I, I just want to, I want to amplify a couple of things and thank the speakers for bringing them to attention. And then I, I will end with a question. The first is that I, I, um, I just want to point out that the, that what Dr. Petratus alluded to at the end, which is that the situation right now with classical homocystinuria and newborn screening is quite similar to where we were with tyrosinemia type one a few years ago where Dr. Matern and others demonstrated that, uh, that the screening method that, that states were using was not effective and not sensitive enough to screen for the disorder. And it required a change uh, in, in the approach. And so I wanna thank the speakers for pointing that out. Uh, the second thing is I would like to point out that the, the remethylation defects, particularly the ones that are not combined with methyl, increased methylmalonic acidemia, continue to be a very serious healthcare problem that is uh, that is really important for to us to address because babies continue to die from these defects uh, and this is well documented in the literature uh, and and the they this amplifies the problem because the primary marker would be a low methionine for those defects and without adding the other markers that were that that Dr. Pasquale alluded to and Dr. Matern alluded to, without adding those additional markers, we're really not gonna be successful at screening for those disorders and babies will continue to die either without a diagnosis or with a diagnosis that was made too late. So I really appreciate the work that all of these people are doing toward that end. Uh, the last thing is I wanna specifically thank Dr. Matern for two comments. One is for uh, pointing out the, the problem with the the lack of a uniform newborn screening system across the country that really inhibits us from uh, achieving the promise, the full promise of newborn screening programs. The second thing I would like to thank you for, Dieter, is the, the comment about the problem of false positives, because right now, the number of false positive screens and all of the tests that we're adding uh, are really limiting our ability to add new tests without without the potential harms due to false positives sinking the boat of newborn screening. And I, you've heard me say this before, but I think that it's absolutely critical that people like the three speakers today continue to push 
to improve our newborn screening methods, uh, as well as state labs and other researchers around the country and world, because we have to reduce the number of false positives or else we're gonna, we're gonna really run into a roadblock of adding new conditions because of the burden of the, of the increasing false positives. Right now in most newborn screening systems, there's 10 false positives for every true positive. So for every condition we add, we're adding 10 times as many false positives. And so uh, that the burden of the false positives eventually sinks the ship uh, and we must address that. And finally, I'll stop making comments and ask a question. For Dr. Pasquale, you said that, um, you said that adding a second tier test can both re uh, in, um, it, it, can it can reduce false positives, but it can also reduce false negatives. Can you just tell us how the addition of a second tier test reduces false negatives? Yes, uh, thank you for, the, for asking that question. <laughs> and um, we know that, uh, again, there is a noise uh, in the in the newborn screening. Uh, and one of the um, solution sometimes to decrease the noise uh, is to act uh, on the decision limit and perhaps uh, increase the value of this decision limit, which is going to increase the number of false negatives. And now, if you have available second tier tests, they will allow you to um, tease out. Uh, all of those that are not really, all of those infants that who do not have a disease, then you can reduce your decision limit, and uh, um, in this case, uh, avoid uh, the false negative as well. Jennifer Kwan. Um, thank you. Um, Jennifer Kwan, committee member. Um, I'm going to make it clear that I'm not a metabolic geneticist, but I am somebody who thinks about homocystinuria from the child neurologist point of view. So I, I think, first of all, I appreciate the comments about trying to reduce false positives and trying to re reduce the number of times we have to interact with families to get new samples, et cetera, as Dr. Matern brought up. Um, this may not be an appropriate question for this group of speakers, and I, I thank you all for excellent talks, but I was just trying to understand how the CDC quality assurance program, when, they, when they're sort of testing newborn screening labs for their ability to detect these conditions, what, what role might they play in helping to improve the quality of homocystinuria screening? And again, this may not be the best uh, question for this group of speakers, but I'm curious about your, your thoughts. Any of you want to take that on? So that's a, kind of a tricky question. Um, uh, you know, we uh, at, uh, at CDC, we do have a proficiency testing uh, program and um, um, we do for first year screening, uh, almost existing. Uh, uh, first year screening for almost urea. And uh, we do provide uh, specimens that uh, have uh, just um, methionine as, uh, um, as a marker. And, uh, you know, the limits that we set, uh, it's um, at, um, uh, you know, at what has been identified for the majority of the uh, laboratories. So we are actually in the process of uh, introducing uh, a new program for second tier screening and alights. Uh, uh, it's gonna be a new proficiency testing program uh, that will include um, a lot of the second tier screening and alights, including total homocysteine uh, and, uh, you know, uh, aloisolicine uh, and all the usual suspects. And I think this uh, will help um, laboratories towards of uh, not only doing methionine, but doing um, uh, testing their uh, platforms for uh, total homocysteine as well. Um, uh, other than that, uh, you know, we can just uh, identify gaps that are currently 
uh, in uh, newborn screening and uh, you know try to come up with new methods uh, and then um, if there are gaps uh, and then uh, train uh, newborn screening uh, uh, scientists uh, we have uh, uh, an annual uh, workshop that takes place uh, in um, uh, in CDC every year, uh, where we train uh, uh, hands-on training in different methods uh, that are out there. So this will be these two methods that I mentioned here: the second-year screening uh, and the first-year screening will be things that we will be uh, teaching uh, laboratories uh, to perform. Uh, and um, you know, if there is any request. Uh, uh, Pre-COVID, at least, uh, we were able to send people uh, in the lab to help uh, with any um, method modification, technology transfer, or, or anything like that. And I think my boss, uh, Carla, will have a much more comprehensive answer than uh, I gave on the subject. Uh, this, this is Carla Cuthbert from CDC. I, I think Costa has covered, uh, covered most of it. Um, uh, one of the things as well, in addition to our own method development strategies internally, which does, again, you see that it does take some effort, um, being able to have and arrange uh, with our partnership with APHL to arrange for states to come in and do um, uh, for technology transfer uh, with respect to our training opportunities. Again, that's been suspended uh, because of COVID. A lot of things have been suspended because of COVID. Uh, because we don't have access to the laboratories uh, as much as we would like on the property. Um, but we also have funding opportunities for the states and, and we put out uh, a certain uh, number of, of uh, funding opportunities for the states, not just to bring on new conditions, but also to help improve existing conditions. And that is really uh, a very significant thing as well. So we really wanted to introduce that uh, into our funding opportunities. So what, it's the sort of thing that, you know, we would like to see a dramatic change, you know, in two years to have every state transition to what we may consider to be an improved platform or testing opportunity. But unfortunately, uh, Jennifer, I, I really appreciate your question, but these things do take some time. And uh, there are other opportunities um, available for people to improve their activities, but uh, we will just keep trudging and moving forward uh, uh, as much as we can. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And just, uh, just one last comment. I know there are a lot of hands up there. Um, I, I think that when I think about um, a child that was diagnosed with um, peri peridoxine responsive homocystinuria, I, I think about um, what the relationship you had with the Texas Newborn Screening Lab and how, um, how important it is to save those dried blood spot cards, right? Because he wasn't diagnosed within two years of life. And um, without, you know, so with, without that primary data to have to go back to, you wouldn't really be able to develop your assays. So I think for me as a citizen, this is another reason to advocate for longer storage of dried blood spot cards so that we can be able to optimize our newborn screening. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take um, one more question or comment from Scott Schoen, but first Dieter, did you want to respond to Jennifer's question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, the CDC does a great job in helping laboratories to um, become technically well-versed in the technology um, to, uh, they send out blood spots and they ask for results back, uh, mostly in terms of quantitative data. And then maybe whether it's a flag that is high or low or normal, uh, but it's not really proficiency testing in terms of uh, sending a blood spot and asking, what is it? Um, uh, so for example, one of our frustrations, and we sometimes get it wrong because we're not allowed to use our second tier test. So when we see a C3 that's elevated, we wanna do the second tier test to figure out what it is, but that's not part of the program. So I think what the CDC should do is focus a little bit more on the interpretive skills of these metabolic profiles. And I appreciate that it's, may be very difficult uh, if you're not a trained biochemical geneticist, uh, but we're not asking to be a biochemical geneticist. We're looking here currently at 50 plus conditions. Uh, so I think that's manageable. Also, and I'm gonna say it only once, there's clear out there to help you 
um, and you can use it. Um, so there, are, there's room for opportunity, and we should not just limit it on uh, single numbers, but it's a profile. Thank you. Thanks, Scott Schoen. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to ask Dieter a quick question. You know, um, uh, uh, Sean mentioned this on SUAC and tyrosinemia type one, and it was this committee who put forth um, sort of a formal. I don't remember what it was called, a uh, recommendation or acknowledgement that succinylacetone was the best marker to screen for tyrosinemia type one. And that helped, I believe it helped a lot of programs get across any barriers that they may have been having internally with either procurement of supplies, equipment, et cetera, et cetera, to get there, you know, some of those late adopters. Um, Dieter, do you think that this committee needs to consider that same pathway for homocystinuria and, and help um, drive some of that um, innovation and, and advancement through CDC's help? I would also say, you know, APHL has their bio, um, their uh, newborn screening fellows, um, and we are a state that are looking to bring on a fellow to do second tier testing for homocystinuria. So, so that's something that we're doing here. So I think there's a lot of pathways, but do you think that we should consider that at the committee, um, or the, I guess the next committee. It won't happen this time with me sitting here, but for the for for a future. Uh, I I think so. Yes, apparently it worked for succinyl acetone, and succinyl acetone. The problem was solved before that discussion started, and I believe it started in 2011, just before I joined the committee. Um, and um, what, what I think happened after uh, the paper was published and endorsed by the, by the committee is that uh, Perk and Elmer either started or finished working on adding succinylacetone to the FDA approved kit. Um, now, if Dr. Patricius is successful and finds a way, and I'm sure that Perk and Elmer is watching and listening and talking to him, uh, it may be a natural evolution, but I think that the committee, if they made a strong statement that you cannot just pretend to screen for homocystinuria, but you actually should do it for the benefit of the babies, uh, that makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you once again to all our speakers today. Um, and I'd also like to thank the HCU Network of America for bringing this to the committee's attention. Um, we'll continue to work uh, with HRSA and other stakeholders about this um, and uh, maybe using what was done for um, succinylacetone to have a national dialogue around this marker. Um, and uh, anyway, we look forward to uh, moving forward with this and helping to, to solve this, this problem. Um, next, uh, we will go to our public comment period. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks at the main meeting, uh, we'll have two public comment periods. Today, we'll hear from seven members of the public who registered to provide these um, oral comments. We also received three written versions of the oral testimony that we will hear today. Um, first, we'll hear from Danae Bartke. Pam, you're muted. There we go. That would probably help if I, you could hear me. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to start by saying uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, come before you and make comment again um, at this event. Um, my name is Danae Barkey, and I'm the executive director of H2 Network America. At the age of 10, I was diagnosed with classical homocystinuria, along with my brother, who was four at the time. At diagnosis, while I was um, asymptomatic, my brother Garrett had missed every major milestone by an average of six to 18 months, and he still continues to feel the repercussions today. When his lens is dislocated, we finally had the missing piece of the puzzle that gave us our diagnosis. My late diagnosis meant years of struggling with the current treatment of the low protein diet, which eventually led to the blood clot. I'm lucky to be here and not be impacted as severely as other patients and be able to lead this patient organization and speak to you today. There are estimates in literature that at least 50% of patients are missed by the current approach of screening for high methionine. 
currently labs have methionine cutoffs ranging from 45 to 100 and even one lab of 150. These estimates support by analysis of medical claims data, as well as the genetic databases looking only at specific defects shown to cause disease. And both analysis would suggest there are even more patients being missed, many who suffer later in life from premature stroke, blood clots, and other issues. We have reached out to our patient community in the US and identified 24 patients across 12 states and were diagnosed within the past 32 years but were missed by new birth screening um, that was in place at the time of their birth, 16 of whom were missed within the last 10 years. 22 of those 24 were non-pyridoxin responsive patients, the more severe type. We believe that, the only, that we have only scratched the surface. In our first presentation, we shared with you three patient stories of children who suffered blood clots with one who eventually passed away. This continues to be the story in our community. A late diagnosis usually means irreversible damage. Late diagnosed patients experience a variety of symptoms that Dr. Pasquale spoke of. Unfortunately, after patients experience these symptoms, there is no way to undo the damage that has been caused. The only way to prevent these issues is to be diagnosed early and start treatment immediately. An improved screening approach would give more patients a better quality of life with lesser chance of risk associated with the disease. We know that all of you and the leaders and staff of the state newborn screening programs and labs want to detect all patients at birth to give them the best chance of optimal care to avoid serious clinical sequelae. We all believe the best long-term approach to assure diagnosis of all HCU patients is to ensure a first-tier screen of homo total homocysteine. We are thrilled to see the progress and commitment the CDC has made, as you heard from Costas and we will support other researchers who may have leads on how to do so. So while the first tier screen may be, may be coming in a few years, you heard this morning there are better solutions to detect for homos, for homocystinary that can be implemented today. Um, some states in the U.S. have adopted these lower cutoffs and adopted a second tier screen that have and we have seen this has proven in a much better approach. This approach was first used by the Mayo Group, um, which you had heard Dr. Return speak of. Others have picked up on second tier screening approach with or without modifications. And a 2019 publication um, from EHAD reiterated the importance of this approach. A few states in the US are already taking advantage of this approach and have started contract, have contracted with Mayo or other states to provide second tier testing. This approach also includes a low methionine cutoff um, that would flag remethylation disorders, which include the majority of the cobalamin disorders and severe MTHR, all which now have evidence within the past year of publication for early detection and treatment, which provide better outcomes. Since our first public comments at the ACHD and C meeting in 2018, we have been meeting with state newborn screening labs. We have been working to learn about their current approach, discuss whether a revised approach makes sense and determine whether we can help in any way to bring forth, forward a revised approach. We are pleased that some labs have already started to make these changes, including low, lowering their methionine threshold and implementing a second tier screen for homocysteine. We are starting to see positive results. Others would like to initiate the changes but don't have the resources but are hoping once the pandemic is less problematic, they can figure a path forward. We know this is a complex area and this solution requires resources. We would urge the committee to prioritize this effort, which many described during the April 2018 meeting as low hanging fruit. We would suggest an endorsement by the ACHDNC of a two tier approach um, that would help make this the priority at a state level along with the encouragement of the ACHDNC of working along to establish a first tier screen for homocysteine. While it could be tempting to wait for the new screen to take action, we suggest not doing so, so that the number of patients being missed each year and the uncertainty as to whether, whether and when the first tier screen will be available. In closing, the HD community would like to thank you for, and the committee for hosting the newborn screening panel on HCU and would like to ask the committee to continue pushing the dial forward and urging and assisting states to make these necessary changes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Terry Klein. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Klein. I'm the president and CEO of the National MPS Society and one of the nominators from our organization for the recently approved MPS2 Rust nomination by the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders and Newborns and Children, all of you. I've spent two decades advocating for MPS and ML disorders as my youngest daughter was diagnosed with mucolipidosis. In 1999, we were not given any hope for her having a long and productive life, but those in her care were mistaken. Today, she is a patient scientist working in clinical trial designs for rare diseases in Raleigh, North Carolina. I share this story because rare diseases like MPS2 Hunter syndrome struggle for awareness and can be devastating for a patient and their families, but science has changed everything. Over the past two decades, MPS2 has seen incredible science and discovery. Researchers, pharmaceutical companies, and patient advocates have been relentless to pave the way to save these boys and men from the devastation of the disease. And with these incredible discoveries, there has only been one obstacle in the way, screening the babies for MPS2. The sophistication of newborn screening with the first and second tier testing will benefit, will benefit the patient community for Hunter syndrome. As we begin to unlock further the implications of the testing modalities, we have the capacity to change the outlook of a newborn baby with MPS2 that include the neuropathic forms of Hunter syndrome. As we have current therapies abroad in clinical trials on, ongoing in the United States that are addressing this very issue. As a leader of a 50-year organization, I speak for our board of directors and our team that we are ready and we're prepared to support and educate every family that will be screened for Hunter syndrome in this country. And I don't say that lightly. Our community has worked diligently to ensure we have the social workers on staff and advocates to guide and support these families. Education, equitable access to treatments, and reaching the diverse population of boys with underserved cultures is critical to our mission. We are already working state by state to add and assist state health labs with literature on Hunter syndrome. The society supports 12 disorders and families from each of these families are grateful for the approval of the ACHD and C in support of the nomination. We are a family at the society and most of these children have grown up with one another regardless of their MPS diagnosis. The joy was felt from coast to coast as you voted this past February with an 11 and one to approve MPS two for newborn screening to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Newborn screening is a successful program and I'm certain we will reach all the hopes of the program as Dr. McCandless had just shared with us a few moments ago. We can reach the top. The ACHDNC's oversight for newborn screening has guided this outcome further. And now with your referral to the Secretary, we will wait anxiously for their signature to the recommended uniform screening panel. As I close my remarks, I wanna reiterate how thankful and grateful the National MPS Society is to have worked with all the professionals who helped us submit the nomination and to each of you on the ACHDNC committee. I thank Mia Morrison for her dedication to the pre-reviews and keeping us on track, to Dr. Alice Kemper, who did an exemplary job of oversight in the technical review, to the University of Michigan team of statisticians who were patient in answering our numerous questions. And finally, to all of you who gave your time so graciously to review the detailed reports and findings. Thank you for the countless teachable moments and for your time today. I speak for all the parents. We will have immeasurable joy when MPS2 is added to Russ, as hunter boys of the future will have drastically better outcomes and quality and longevity of their lives. Knowing this, you have helped create medical change and medical history, and this is not easy to do. So thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Dylan Simon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Powell, uh, and to the rest of the members of the advisory committee for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, on behalf of the over 30 million Americans living with rare diseases, the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases is pleased to offer the following comments to inform the committee's ongoing conversations about the review process for Ross nomination packages. Uh, the Every Life Foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering the rare disease patient community to advocates for impactful science-driven legislation and policy that advances the equal development of and access to uh, life-saving diagnosis, treatments, and cures. Uh, the Community Congress is a forum for collaboration across stakeholders, representing over 200 individual rare disease patient advocacy organizations, in addition to over 100 other healthcare and biotechnology organizations. Our New World Screening Diagnosis Working Group is one of our four working groups of the Community Congress which is dedicated to ensuring that rare disease community receive the earliest possible access to life-saving diagnostic opportunities through newborn screening and other diagnostic tools. We applaud the community's recommended addition of MPS2 to the RUSP. 
Uh, once accepted and implemented, the addition of MPS2 will provide approximately 38 MPS2 babies born annually in the United States the opportunity to access time, timely life-saving early diagnosis and treatment. However, we wish to note that during the committee's review of the MPS2 nomination, there were discussions of topics we feel are outside the scope of the MPS2 review. Uh, during the Every Live Community Congress New Board Training Working Group meeting that followed the advisory committee February meeting, members expressed their concerns directly. Uh, comments centered on worries that some of the discussions by the committee strayed from the task of examining the quality of evidence of MPS2 nomination and its impact on the public health system, and instead focus on the challenges presented by the current healthcare system. While such discussions are important, and we are grateful for the community's commitment to addressing these challenges, uh, we ask the committee to ensure that such important discussions do not become barriers to enabling new worthy conditions for being added to the rust. As a rare disease community, we appreciate the committee is working to prepare for an anticipated increase in rust nominations. As the committee navigates the increased demand, we remind the committee the importance of formally including the patient community voice in the review process and the importance of expanding review capacity. Uh, as the committee begins the selection and onboarding process of new members, I request the committee commit to seeing all 50, 15 member positions filled. By fully staffing the committee, discussions of nominations, their review, and the broader newborn screening ecosystem will benefit from the greater expertise and personal experience that a fully con uh, constituted com committee will provide. As the committee prepares to onboard these new members, we ask for increased transparency in the onboarding process. As an organization dedicated to supporting patient advocates, we want to ensure that the patient voice is represented throughout the onboarding process. We also request the committee include two clinical representatives from the te technical evidence review committee in the final review discussion to help answer questions as they come up during the committee's final deliberation. The inclusion of these experts will allow for key insights into the impact new board would have on the disease community and will allow them to respond to any specific inquiries about the conditions that may arise. Uh, as the committee con considers how to handle the increasing number of Russell nominations, we strongly encourage the committee to focus on expanding their capacity to review these conditions as opposed to focusing on to prioritize nominated conditions. We worry that focusing on prioritization of conditions could limit the rust and close it off to other worthy rare diseases. The committee has stated that they're capable of supporting only two evidence reviews uh, per year. We understand that while the committee may have a limited ability at the moment to increase the number, we also ask that they provide increased transparency concerning the docket of pending nominations. We recommend that transparency include a brief synopsis at each meeting of all pending nominations, with respected dates and where they are in the process, to include the dates and other relevant information regarding submission to HRSA, assignment to the nominalization prioritization working group, those undergoing the evidence review group review, uh, and those included with the evidence review, review discussion and vote. Patient organizations prepare for many years building evidence and developing the nomination package and require a clear timetable of when the rust review could potentially take place after their submission. Uh, we are thankful over the last few advisory committee meetings, the committee has highlighted challenges associated with newborn screening outside the rust. Presentations discussing various workforce issues have helped to highlight how many professionals are connected to the newborn screening. As more treatments for diseases are developed, the newborn screening will continue to look at ways to address these current challenges. However, we request that these conversations occur outside the individual rust nomination review processes and continue to be a separate activity of the advisory committee. Uh, we appreciate the committee's dedication to meeting our increasing demands on the nation's newborn screening program. And we are especially grateful for your unwavering dedication to our rare disease patient communities. The Every Life Foundation and the membership of our Community Congress Working Group stand ready to support your work, and we look forward to engaging with you in the coming months. Thanks so much. Thank you. Dean Soar. Yes, good morning, uh, and thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak. As always, we want to remind you of our appreciation of and thanks for the important, hard, and impactful work of this committee and the evidence-based review group. And we'd like to offer a special uh, thanks to Chairman, uh, Chairperson uh, Powell and uh, Dr. Schoen for your service. Four million babies a year are directly impacted with some 13,000 babies identified each year through newborn screening. Yet, as we all know, there are many other disorders that could be identified at birth or during childhood. Just like current screen disorders, screening for all new disorders will save and improve the lives of thousands of additional babies. MLD is one of those disorders. MLD newborn screening is a pilot study in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, in the U.S., MLD patients are already being treated with a gene therapy that was approved in the EU by the European Commission in December 2020, about 18 months ago, and is on the path to a formal U.S. review and approval. We hope to submit an MLD RUST nomination for your review in the near future, but that's not the topic of my comments today. 
Empowering and increasing the operational capabilities, impact, sustainability, and continuous improvement of the committee are key needs and areas that advocacy is actively interested in and actively supporting. These external efforts are carried on in many ways through individual and umbrella organizations at the state and federal levels, including not only in public health, but also in awareness, education, family support, research, therapy development, therapy access and reimbursement, and legislative policy and, and development and implementation, as well as appropriations in support of that policy. All of this resulting in improvements in quality of life for newborns and their families. My comments today focus on the nomination of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases to be an organizational representative. I previously provided the committee with a formal written letter of support and will not reread it here, but I did wanna highlight some of its content. The Every Life Foundation meets the organizational representative requirements. They have wide ranging newborn screening and heritable disorders interests and activities. They're already actively informing the committee. We just heard from Dylan. Uh, through their community congresses, newborn screening working group, they represent dozens, if not hundreds of organizations and disorders as they form recommendations and develop programs and activities in support of newborn screening. In newborn screening specifically, uh, with the Newborn Screening Saves Lives uh, reauthorization, they not only supported the 2011, 2014, and 2019 reauthorization, which as we know now is still a pending 2022 reauthorization, but they're working to expand the content of the bill to be able to support uh, expansion of committees, the committee's impact and capabilities with budget to improve your operational capacity and state support activities. They're very active in RUSP alignment. This is legislation that uh, uh, ties your recommended uniform screening panel to activities at the state levels to either review or implement uh, screens that are approved by this committee. They started in 2017 with RUSP alignment in California, were quickly followed by Florida, and there are now at least five states with formal RUSP alignment legislation, and 20 states this year during their 2022 sessions that introduced RUSP alignment bills. Their Community Congress Newborn Screening Working Group is focused on helping the community to be more informed, educated, organized, and impactful. More broadly, the Every Life Foundation works on awareness, novel and efficient research approaches, empowering and educating advocacy to impact clinical trials, and regulatory and reimbursement approvals. They actively develop innovative and new policies resulting in legislation and appropriations in support of these efforts. They will bring all of this uh, experience and effort to newborn screening uh, so that you can continue to, so that you will benefit from these parallel efforts. In support of all these efforts, they recently completed a national economic burden of rare disease study, formally identifying and publishing nearly a trillion dollars of annual direct and indirect rare disease costs. These sorts of efforts help to quantify the impact of timely diagnostics and therapeutic access and other aspects of the committee's work and recommendation. In closing, I strongly suggest the committee consider the Every Life Foundation as an ideal organizational representative to not only inform the committee, but also to magnify the impact of your work. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Kim Stevens. Thank you, Dr. Powell. And thank you for providing me with this opportunity to offer comments to this committee today. Um, my name is Kim Stevens, and I'm president of Project Alive, which is an MPS research and advocacy organization. I'm also the mother of a boy with MPS2. But today I'm speaking on behalf of the 30 million Americans living with a rare disease and as co-chair of the Every Life Foundation's Newborn Screening and Diagnostics Working Group. As we've heard before, the Every Life Foundation is a nonprofit nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering the rare disease patient community to advocate for impactful science-driven legislation and policy that advances the equitable development of and access to life-saving diagnoses, treatments, and cures. Over the past year, the advisory committee has reviewed and updated its processes including efforts focused on ensuring patient advocacy organizations have a better understanding of the RUSP nomination process and the role that patient advocacy organizations play in newborn screening and RUSP nominations. As the advisory committee and HRSA began to review the nominations for the two open committee positions, we urge the advisory committee to include a patient advocacy organization representative representative as one of these two members to be appointed, ensuring that this constituency is represented on the committee as it has been in the past. 
An appropriately qualified patient advocate is an expert on their rare disease, and they can provide insight on the impact newborn screening can have on the rare disease community. Patient representatives can lend their ex experience, which often includes being a patient, a parent, a caregiver, a scientist, a poly policy expert to the nomination review process, providing a distinct understanding of the significance of early diagnosis and treatment. Patient representatives lend insight into how families juggle the cost of treatment and how patient communities and providers can support families diagnosed through newborn screening. It is essential the committee once again incorporate this perspective into the work that they do both during the RUSP nomination process and their work outside of the RUSP. Continued inclusion of a patient advocacy organization representative as a committee member can also build trust and understanding in the committee has worked to foster with these organizations. It can signal to the patient advocacy community that our voice remains important to not only the RUSP review process, but in discussions about how to improve the newborn screening system and prepare it for the influx of new disorders. Including the advocate's voice builds diversity and inclusion on the committee and encourage further discussion and input by these patient advocates. The inclusion of a patient advocate can help to alleviate fears that problems outside of issues specific to a disease nomination may prevent a disorder from being added to the RUSP or then the absence of an authentic advocate voice, non-patient advocates speak erroneously on the advocate perspective during committee deliberations. Patient advocacy organizations are a vital piece of the newborn screening system and must have meaningful input on committee decisions that have the power to affect the entire newborn screening ecosystem. Representatives from patient advocacy organizations come from diverse backgrounds and they can bring their own set of expertise to the committee. Patient representatives can serve as a bridge between the patient advocacy community and the committee, fostering more buy-in and support from even the most skeptical patient advocates. Like the committee, advocacy organizations want to ensure that we build a strong newborn screening system that can provide life-saving diagnosis to newborns and that could withstand the many challenging challenges that it faces now and in the future. As the committee and HRSA consider adding a patient advocacy organization representative, we encourage you to define what is meant when you consider a patient advocacy organization. The National Health Council sets standards for patient organizations interested in becoming members of the council, and we ask the committee to consider these standards when defining a patient advocacy organization. These standards require organizations to be engaged in research, professional education, public education and health promotion, health services, community services, advocacy, or social action. So when considering a patient advocacy organization representative, we encourage you, the committee to define patient advocacy organization as an organization engaged in one or more of these areas. We also ask the committee to follow National Health Council standards and define a patient advocacy organization as an organization that has been active in the space for no less than three years. We are grateful for the committee's previous inclusion of a patient advocate as a committee member and for all the work that is occurring within the newborn screening space and for all the updates the committee is making to the RUSP nomination process. We are committed to working with the committee to incorporate the patient voice more thoroughly by including a patient advocacy organization representative on the committee. On behalf of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases Community Congress, Newborn Screening and Diagnostics work, Working Group, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Kim Tuminello, followed by Heidi Wallace uh, regarding GAMP deficiency. Okay. Good morning. My name is Kim Tuminello, and I'm the Director of Advocacy uh, for Association for Creatine Deficiencies and co-founder. 
And um, I am also a mother of two GAMP children, one that was diagnosed at 10 months and a younger sibling that was diagnosed uh, in utero and treated since birth. And I can tell you as a mom that they've had two very different lives and they will continue to have very different lives. Um, I just wanna take a quick moment and thank um, this advisory committee for their service uh, to newborn screening program. Um, and I wanna thank the evidence review board um, for taking this past nine months to review GAMT in depth. I know it's been a journey for all of us. Um, I'm confident that GAMT has once again proven itself to be the no brainer of newborn screening. Um, it's easily detectable with its elevated guanidino acetate an almost non-existent uh, false positive rate, which as this committee discussed earlier is extremely important. Um, it's an incredibly easy treatment that could literally be ordered online um, and safe and most importantly, an effective treatment. Um, it's been six years since we started this journey almost to the day of nominating GAMP for the first time. And we were given the word that we needed to find a baby during a newborn screen. And um, I'd like to thank New York and Utah for both taking on that challenge and screening. And as luck would have it, Murphy's Law, we found those babies within a certain quick amount of time um, close to each other, uh, which I think is really exciting. And I think it proves the point that um, there is a need for uh, the universal screening of, of GAMPT those babies have a really bright future, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and as a parent and a community member, um, I'm really excited for today. I'm excited for the vote and um, I'm excited to see the secretary sign count into newborn screening. And um, again, I just really wanna say thank you to all of you for your work. Thank you, Kim, that was great. Um, so my name is Heidi Wallace. I'm the executive director for the Association for Creatine Deficiencies. Mm -hmm. You all are probably tired of seeing my face and hearing from me. <laughs> so thank you for your time today and over the past six years. Um, thank you also to the, the evidence review committee um, and for your inclusion of myself and my participation in the process. 